From Covenant Presbyterian Church, this is Wednesday Night Live, our weekly Bible study walking through the book of James. Tonight, episode 9 of our study covering chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Now, live in historic downtown Fort Smith, here's our teacher, Dr. John Clayton. Welcome once again to Wednesday Night Live. I'm thankful that you have tuned in tonight. I'm thankful that we can gather together and study God's Word together. And I'm thankful that we've been able to continue this study through the book of James. Let me pray for us. Our gracious God in heaven, we do thank you for your Word. And we thank you for the study through the book of James. We thank you for what you are teaching us. We thank you how you are revealing to us not only our own sinfulness, but also what God desires of us. We thank you that we have seen God's grace extended to us in Christ Jesus. And we pray that you would guide and direct us by your Holy Spirit that we might live out the truth of this faith in our lives. We pray this dependently in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've got a short study tonight. Uh, We're only going to look at verses 13 through 17 of chapter 4. This is going to set the stage for where we're going to go next week. So let's look at these verses together. Again, starting in verse 13 of chapter 4. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. Such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him It is sin. Now, as a general theme, what we see James teaching us is that there is a difference between God's will and our selfish plans. And that's not good, is it? Uh, We should have these two in union, should we not? And so James is going to confront this error in the passage that we're looking at tonight, God's will versus our plans. And to start this study, let's look at the first two verses. And what we're going to see right from the beginning is that there is a right way to plan and there is a wrong way to plan. First, James is going to start with the wrong way to plan. Come now, you who say... Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there, trade, make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. And what we see in these two first verses is that the wrong way to plan our lives is with presumption. Presumption. Presumption is the wrong way to plan. What is James confronting? Well, let's think back about what we have seen and what we have learned about this congregation, about this church to whom are the first recipients of James' letter. And by now, within our study, we have learned a little bit about them. And so we actually know, you actually know a little more about their presumption than you may realize. Think back to chapter 1. And in chapter 1, verse 11, we see that James is confronting, or rather cautioning them, about the rich man. And that rich man will fade away in the midst of his pursuits. That sounds very similar to what we're looking at in verse 13, isn't it? Making plans apart from God, not thinking of God. The second thing that we see about this church 
is that they needed to be reminded that their Christian life lived out within the world takes into consideration the underprivileged, takes into consideration those who have the greatest need. It's, it's showing mercy to the widows and the orphans in tangible ways. And then we see that he, James is confronting the Christians of this church in their partiality. They're showing favoritism to the rich, but not to the poor. In fact, they're dishonoring the poor man. The recipients of James' epistle were likely affluent enough to develop a worldly independence and a sense of autonomy. Well, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? It sounds a lot like us. It sounds a lot like Christians throughout the ages. That there is a temptation to think that we who have been saved by God's grace through faith in Christ, after that, I got it from here, God. Thanks for the ticket to heaven, but I'll take it from here. I've got it. Well, that presumption is sinful. And James is confronting that. James says, Come now, you who say. Now we need to pause there and remember that James' use of language or the sins of the tongue is a more comprehensive understanding than the way we think of it in a modern sense. Uh, the sins of the tongue include the sins of the heart and the mind. What we're thinking, what we're feeling, uh, what, what our motives are, etc. All of this is tied up in what is expressed. And so the presumption is, is that we go and do something. But does that mean that planning is wrong? Is James saying that we should not be people who make plans? Well, no, not at all. What is glaringly obvious in these first two verses is that this is someone, or these are people, who make plans without consideration of God. God is not in their plans. Puritan Matthew Henry says, this is a fool's errand. He says, the frailty shortness, and uncertainty of life ought to check the vanity and presumptuous confidence of all projects for futurity. Anything that we're planning ought to be checked against pleasing God, glorifying God, seeking God's counsel, seeking God's wisdom. These people who plan their lives, as one commentator puts it, their futures without thought or plans of God's sovereignty. They are disregarding God in what they plan to do. Now again, James is not confronting the issue of planning for the future. In fact, let's pause here for just a second. What does the Bible teach us about planning for the future? Well, we could just camp out in the Proverbs and get plenty to give us guidance here. For example, in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5, it says, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Or... The Proverbs teaches us to consider the ant. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. Uh, planning is commended. Planning is wise. It is a good thing to make plans. Wherein is the problem? Well, again... In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, it says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And that's the acknowledgement that needs to be made, and that is the worship that we give to God when we go to God seeking wisdom for our plans, that God is glorified through that. And so James is not confronting the practice of planning for the future. 
which is biblically warranted, but the presumptuous attitude of planning without a humble submission to the sovereignty of God. The temptation for you, the temptation for me, is to make plans without thought or prayer to God. What's going on in your own life? Do you have big plans coming up in your future? Do you have things that maybe not consciously thinking, but by not taking it to God in prayer, you have in essence said, hey, I've got it, God. I'll bring you the big stuff. Or when there's a, a tragedy, I'll come to you. But, but I've got this. It's okay. Uh, no, no, no. James is confronting that. He's telling us that that is presumptuous and that is the wrong way to plan. As important as our plans may seem and the self-importance they may encourage, from an eternal perspective, we are but, what's James call us? We're but a mist. The problem with many of us is, is that we see our lives, we see ourselves, and everything that we're go- dealing with in our lives as the pinnacle of importance. Well, James is bringing this back into check. You're just not that important. I'm just not that important. My plans, they're just not that important. Compared to God's plans. Compared to God's sovereignty. And so this needs to be brought into check, James is teaching us here. One commentator says, Restoring health for a time to a man's body amounts to no more than extending his breath for a little while longer. Therefore, it should not be considered of great importance because it is temporal, not eternal. That commentator was Augustine of Hippo. Uh, and what he was reminding us is life is but a vapor. It's a mist. It passes. Don't think that your issues in life, my issues in life, are so important that they trump God's plans and God's will for our lives. So what's the right way to plan? If presumption is the wrong way to plan, this self-importance, this autonomy, or perceived autonomy, if that's the wrong way to plan, what is the right way to plan? Well, look at verse 15. It, instead, instead of being presumptuous, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. The right way to plan is not presumption, but dependence. Oh, we as Americans, we don't like to hear that, do we? We think, oh no, we need to be independent. We need to be self-supporting, self-sustaining. Well, that's true in a sense, but not when it comes to God's provision. Not when it comes to our Heavenly Father. We are to be dependent upon Him. As we are dependent upon Him, He gets the glory. Note the connection between when James says, you should say, and the heart. The point here is what? The point's a right heart attitude. James is not talking about lip service, and he's not talking about memorized phrases. If you say something, and then you just have decided in your own personal vocabulary that you're going to add to that, if the Lord wills, as if that is somehow compliant with Scripture, as if that somehow yields God's blessing upon whatever you have said, I've got to correct you. That is just lip service. You don't need to memorize slogans or cliches or even Bible verses that you think somehow might be manipulatively inserted into a sentence that would therefore make you obedient. That is not what James is talking about here. What he's talking about is a right heart attitude of dependence. Am I making plans... Seeking God's will. 
Am I making plans in my life that give God the glory? Proverbs chapter 16, verse 1. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Uh, the Proverbs, uh, the writer of Proverbs is, is using this play on words of showing us uh, in essence that, that we can seek to, in this case, in keeping with James, to make a plan, but ultimately, ultimately God is the one who guides and directs our heart as we seek to please Him. Matthew Henry says, Our time time in which we live, our lives, our times are not in our own hands, but at the disposal of God. Our heads may be filled with cares and contrivances for ourselves or our families or our friends, but providence often throws our plans into confusion. All we design and all we do should be with submissive dependence upon God. Oh boy, aren't we learning that in the age in which we live. Uh, right now, we're within uh, the pandemic of COVID-19, the coronavirus here in the United States, and of course, all around the world. And you and I could get together over a cup of coffee, and we could talk about all the myriad of plans that have changed. At the beginning of this, before the, the quarantine, uh, we were going to take a family trip to, to Nashville, to visit my son and, and daughter-in-law, and then that got changed. And then all of a sudden, that led to another change, and that led to another change, and there were all sorts of things. And, and it was about, I don't know how it was with you, but for me, it took me about three weeks before I, had, I was able to just finally <sighs> exhale and realize, oh, you preacher of the Word, are you listening to the words that you preach God is sovereignly in control, and we are dependent upon Him for every aspect of our lives. And God, in His sovereign purpose, which incidentally, He's not going to roll out and reveal to you in His secret will, He has chosen to do what He has done for His greater purposes and His glory. And so, relax. Trust the providence of God, and James is taking us here. It's, that's the kind of attitude, that right heart attitude that we are to have, to trust the Lord in things great and small. Again, as James says it here, if the Lord wills, that expression which is consistently used throughout the Bible. Again, as I said, it's, it's not a conditional submission to fatalism, but rather it is a conviction. It's not saying, well, you know, our family wasn't able to go to Nashville. We're just victims of whatever comes along. No, 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 no. That's not what James is teaching us here. And it, by saying, if the Lord wills, is not just throwing in the towel for good and prudent and wise planning. Nope. What it is teaching us is about a conviction. A conviction that God is sovereign over all things. Do you believe that? Do I believe that? I know our theology teaches that, but do I believe it and live it out in my life? In how I live my life and how you live your life. Look with me again now. Look back up to verse 14 and now 15. And I want to draw your attention to three verbs that I think are important that really draw out the meaning of this text. James starts in verse 14. You do not know. Implying what? Ignorance. Are you God? No, I know you're not. And I'm not either. So do you know what the future is? So I don't either. But God does. And so you do not know. You have the ignorance of a human being. As do I. But then look at the next verb. You are. Obviously subject and verb. You are. Implying what? Finite existence. You're not God, 
You're what? Well, you're a human being, and I'm a human being. We are finite creations. We are not God. And then finally, in verse 15, subject and verb, you ought to say. You ought to say. Subject, add, add verb, and verb. Uh, somebody, I'm sure, is correcting my grammar here. Uh, but you ought to say, which is implying what? Dependence. And so, the ignorance of saying that somehow I'm going to plan my way, James says, well, the providence of God comes along and shows you what? You're not God. I'm not God. Shows us that you're a human being. Well, I'm a human being. Shows us what? That we're dependent upon God Almighty in everything. In all things, we are dependent upon. Upon God. All right. So we've looked at the wrong way to plan, and then we've looked, which is presumption. We looked at the right way to plan, which is dependence. And then let's go back to this wrong way of planning. Is it really that bad? I mean, is it? Don't we all presume that we understand things that we may not fully understand that God does? Is it really wrong? to be presumptuous in our planning. Well, look at verse 16. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Whoop. Did you catch that? That got inserted at the end, didn't it? All such boasting is just being human. All such boasting is, well, it's just what we do. Well, we're not perfect. No, James will not let us get away with any of that nonsense. He says it is evil. And so it's not just that it's bad planning. No, it is evil. Evil presumption. Presumption of the future is essentially arrogant boasting. And James is saying that that is evil. Now the word boast here, uh, which we think of it in, in the era in which, the modern era in which we live, and especially around either politics or sports or things like that, and, and people make these these boasts about themselves. Uh, but as it is used here, It means presumptuous bragging. It's not just bragging. It's bragging that we can do what we want to do. That we can be who we want to be. We can insert whatever sort of modern cliche you want to there. The point is is that it is a bragging that presumes on your ability and my ability apart from the sovereignty of God of God. And so James is calling it like it is here, isn't he? He's saying that is sin. And it's not just that they're making plans without any consideration of God, but they are also arrogantly boasting in what they perceive to be their autonomy. John Calvin says on this, though they robbed God of his government, they yet flattered themselves Yet they, yet not that they openly set themselves up as superior to God, though they were especially inflated with confidence in themselves, but that their minds were inebriated with vanity so as to disregard God. <laughs> I, I believe that's John Owen's translation of Calvin, if I remember correctly. Um, that little last phrase there uh, really sums it up so well. Uh, Calvin says that their minds were uh, inebriated, or they were intoxicated, they were drunk with what? Drunk with vanity, so as to disregard God. They were so, in keeping with Calvin's phrase, they were so drunk on their own self-perceived importance that God never even came into their mind. They never once thought 
about God's sovereign purpose nor His glory. And then finally, we've looked at the wrong way to plan, which is presumption, the right way to plan, which is dependence, uh, uh, dependence upon God. We've looked at the evil that this presumption is, this bragging, this presumptuous bragging. And then in verse 17, James says, So, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. In other words, we are to, or rather we who know, we who know are to live it out. That's right. You and I as Christians, we who know the truth of God's Word, we are to live it out in our lives. Does this verse then conclude this passage that we're looking at here? And, and James begins this sentence with the word so, uh, or it's translated in the NIV, then, or in the NASB, therefore. Uh, and and, and he's, he's creating a kind of conclusion, or I would say he is summing up in one statement what he has been teaching us in this passage. James will not allow us to disconnect knowing from thinking and saying and doing. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Make your plans, but submit yourself to Almighty God in His sovereign purpose. Seek His counsel in prayer. Seek His wisdom in His word. Let us make our plans fully and humbly submitted to God. Because those of us who know God, and those of us who know His Word, as we step forward in our self-perceived autonomy, that indeed is evil. And so that's our caution for us tonight. Now we'll use this as the foundation that it to then move into our next passage, and we'll study that next week. Uh, Thanks for being here tonight. Let me pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You again for Your Word, and we thank You uh, for Your teaching to us tonight. We pray that we would be wise stewards of what You have given us, and that we would not be self-presumptuous, that we would not boast in such presumption, but rather we would walk as children who are dependent upon their Father and His provision. O God, help us, have mercy upon us, and guide and direct us to walk as is fitting as children of Yours, and to live for You in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.